What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. And, you know, I have to say, I'm thankful that this platform has been going on for a couple years before it was hyper trendy to um, center black voices in and outside of the workplace. I am. I'm thankful for that. With that in mind, today we have uh, Dr. Rosenthal, who will be talking about how child slavery has helped inform a lot of formal and informal practices in the workplace today. Um, you'll notice at one point of our conversation that we talk about overseers or um, in layman's terms, slaves that were picked by the planters or plantation owners to watch over the rest of the slaves. Um, like all things regarding American slavery, this was a method of control through delegation. Um, and one thing I want to caution in this moment, both leaders and non-leaders alike, is not modeling this, especially in your um, your diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Right. So what do I mean by that? So white comfort. It's not only the default. It's not just the default in diversity and inclusion. It's not just the default at work. It's the default in America. It's the gravitational force by which all things center on or center back to. So there's going to be a constant pressure to frame things, say things, do things that do not make the majority uncomfortable. So to leaders, I will say um, it's easy, unintentionally or otherwise, to pick and position voices that you're comfortable with as representatives of your diversity councils or panelists for your events or employee resource groups. I um, mean, so my challenge to you in this moment is to push past your comfort and listen to better yet truly cede power to voices that challenge you. OK, um, and so and so then. With that same spirit, I wanted to say to my chosen few who end up being selected in these positions, interrogate your own intentions, right? This is not an opportunity for a come up. This is an opportunity to drive real equity for the people that look like you. Um, and so ask yourself how you can take the privilege and access and platform you've been temporarily granted again, noticed temporarily granted. And how you can use that to help other people, right? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to play a clip from a speech by Malcolm X, and then we're going to pivot into the conversation that we had with Dr. Rosenthal earlier this year. Catch y'all next time. Peace. Back during slavery, there was two kinds of slaves. There was the house Negro and the field Negro. The house Negro, they lived in the house with master. They dressed pretty good. They ate good, because they ate his food. What he left. <laughs> they lived in the attic or the basement, but still they lived near their master. And they loved their master more than the master loved himself. They would, they would give their life to save their master's house quicker than the master would. The house Negro, if the master said, we got a good house here, the house Negro say, yeah, we got a good house here. <laughs> Whenever the master said we, he said we. That's how you can tell a house Negro. If the, master's, if the master's house caught on fire, the house Negro would fight harder to put the blaze out than the master would. If the master got sick, the house Negro would say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. We sick. He identified himself with his master more than his master identified with himself. And if you came to the house Negro and said, let's run away, let's escape, let's separate, that house Negro would look at you and say, man, you crazy. What you mean separate? Where is there a better house than this? Where can I wear better clothes than this? Where can I eat better food than this? That was that house Negro. In those days, he was called a house nigger. And that's what we call him today because we still got some house niggers running around here. This modern house Negro loves his master. He wants to live near him. He'll pay three times as much as the house is worth just to live near his master. 
and then brag about I'm the only Negro out here. <laughs> I'm the only one on my job. I'm the only one in this school, you nothing but a house Negro. And if someone come to you right now and say, let's separate, you say the same thing that the house Negro said on the plantation. What you mean separate? From America? This good white man? Where you gonna get a better job than you get here? I mean, this is what you say. I, I ain't left nothing in Africa. That's what you say. Why you left your mind in Africa. <laughs> On that same plantation, there was the field Negro. The field Negro, those were the masses. There was always more Negroes in the field then there was Negroes in the house. The Negro in the field caught hell. He ate leftovers. In the house, they ate high up on the hull. The Negro in the field didn't get nothing but what was left of the insides of the hull. They call them chitlins nowadays. In those days, they call them what they were, guts. That's what you were, a gut eater. And some of you are all still gut eaters. <laughs> the field Negro was beaten from morning till night. He lived in a shack, in a hut. He wore cast off clothes and he hated his master. I say he hated his master. He was intelligent. That house Negro loved his master. But that field Negro, remember, they were in the majority and they hated the master. When the house caught on fire, he didn't try and put it out. That field Negro prayed for a wind, <laughs> for a breeze. When the master got sick, the field Negro prayed that he died. <laughs> if someone come to the field Negro and said, let's separate, let's run, he didn't say, where are we going? He said, any place is better than here. <laughs> you got field Negroes in America today. I'm a field Negro. The masses are the field Negroes. When they see this man's house on fire, you don't hear these little Negroes talking about our government is in trouble. They say the government is in trouble. Imagine a Negro, our government, I even heard one say, our astronauts. <laughs> they won't even let him near the plant. And our astronauts, our Navy, that's a Negro that's out of his mind. That's a Negro that's out of his mind. Just as the slave master in that day used Tom, the house Negro, to keep the field Negroes in check, the same old slave master today has Negroes who are nothing but modern Uncle Toms, 20th century Uncle Toms, to keep you and me in check, keep us under control, keep us passive and peaceful and nonviolent. That's Tom making you nonviolent. It's like when you go to the dentist and the man is going to take your tooth. You're going to fight him when he starts pulling. So they squirt some stuff in your jaw called Novocaine to make you think they're not doing anything to you. <laughs> so you sit there and cause you got all that Novocaine in your jaw, you suffer peacefully. <laughs> <laughs> the 
blood running all down your jaw and you don't know what's happening because someone has taught you to suffer peacefully. The white man do the same thing to you in the street. When he don't want to put knots on your head and take advantage of you and don't have to be afraid of you fighting back, to keep you from fighting back, he get these old religious Uncle Toms to teach you and me that just like Nova King, suffer peacefully. Don't stop suffering, just suffer peacefully. Today, we have a whole PhD on the podcast, y'all. A whole, not a half, a whole PhD. Dr. Caitlin Rosenthal. Dr. Caitlin Rosenthal is an assistant professor of history at UC Berkeley. She was previously a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard, and she's brought history into fresh focus with her new book, Accounting for Slavery, Masters in Management, which examines how white owners of enslaved black people were early innovators of many business practices and terms we use today. Dr. Rosenthal's work has been featured in Boston Review, and Harvard Business Review, just to name a couple. So let me just say this to start, okay? And this is a longer monologue than we typically do, but I mean, this matters to me, right? I, black folks are often looked at as annoying or conspiracists or dramatic or whatever you want to call it when we go all the way back to slavery to contextualize the world that we live in today. Yet, here we have you, Dr. Rosenthal, a whole professor who's done work in examining the complex managerial systems of the 18th and 19th century plantation owners. It's an honor to have you here Welcome to the show, and how are you doing? I'm doing well, um, and I'm delighted to be here for what seems to be a really, really important conversation. And like you say, um, you know, it's been a learning experience for me to see how much pushback people get when they say something goes all the way back to slavery, because it, of course, does go all the way back to slavery through Jim Crow, through redlining, through everything. But um, I think it's really powerful to take the conversation all the way back. Well, you know, it's interesting. A lot of times, you know, folks will be like, slavery was 3,000 years ago. It's like, dog, no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're like only a couple of generations away. Right. I mean, I'm, there was this like, comedian one time he said, like, if you took like two old black grandmas and put them together, that's slavery. Was that long ago? Like, it's not that long ago. Um, and, um, you know, I don't want to bury the lead, right? So, so let me ask you a question, perhaps out of sequence. I would imagine some folks that are listening to this podcast, folks who read your work even, even if only at a summary level, um, the question has to be, so what? So what should executive leaders, what should leaders, what should white folks, what should people in any type of position of authority at work, what should they take from the work that you've done? So the, my book, Accounting for Slavery, is really an effort to write slavery back into the history of management practices and to the history of business more broadly. From productivity analysis to cost accounting, slaveholders were in many ways at the forefront of using innovative management practices. And what should we take away from that? I think it's really two things. One is how compatible violence and coercion can be with business practices and with, with American capitalism. And so this is a story about how those two really difficult things can go together, which means we've got to be really, really careful if we want to have a more humane version of capitalism and more humane work environments. I think it's also a picture of, you know, for me, it's about the need for labor regulation. Um, the abolition of slavery is a landmark in labor regulation. And this is, is in a way, these records that I use are portraits of what management practices can look like if planters and business people were allowed to do basically anything they wanted. And if anything, including lives was up for sale. You know, as I read your book, I think about Nicole Hannah-Jones. You talked to, you just talked about it a little bit at the top, but um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who shared the amount of vitriol that she's received and continues to receive uh, regarding the uh, 1619 Project, not only from the public, but from like academics. You know, what was your journey like compiling this research and how would you characterize its reception in academic arenas? So first, since you mentioned the New York Times 1619 project, which I think is such a powerful piece of public history, you know, I have been amazed by the amount of pushback Nicole Hannah Jones has gotten for her work. Um, and I think uh, it's, you know, partly it's been a learning experience for me watching, I think black scholars and black journalists get a lot more pushback than white scholars do working on some of these same issues. Um, so it's been a learning process for me about kind of how much we haven't yet reckoned with slavery. And her work is doing some of that difficult work, but she's getting just huge amounts of pushback for it. Work, work amounts of pushback that are totally out of line with what I think are the empirical critiques of the project. I think the project is gets the big picture exactly right. 
um, and it's a, like a, it's totally amazing. So now, for for my own work, I have gotten some pushback, and I will tell you the most enlightening thing about kind of taking this project out into the world, and I mostly work with historians and economists, is that you have two almost opposite reactions. One is people are like, of course planters were using advanced management techniques. If, from what we know about the history of slavery, uh, it was a big business um, and um, we have plantation elites that have lots of re resources at their disposal. We know the most millionaires in the country at the time are in the richest districts of the Cotton South. So of course they were using advanced management practices. What's new here? And then the other opposite perspective is people are totally shocked. Like they're absolutely surprised because they think that slavery was holding everyone back. But it's not holding everybody back. It was holding enslaved people back. It was sometimes holding poor whites back, but it certainly wasn't holding planters back. And people are really shocked that they were advanced and even innovative in their practices. So it like really illustrates the kind of way we have to go in America in a way to kind of move the conversation forward. Because a lot of people know this and sure there's new new things for them in my work pointing to the specific management practices that the planters were using. Um, but they don't find it that surprising. And then there's a whole nother audience that's totally shocked. So you talk about being shocked. So like when you say they're shocked, is it disbelief or denial? Or is it like, wow, is it like genuine surprise? Like, oh, I just never thought about that before. So actually, I think you get both. Some of it is, is surprise. Like, you know, I once had a conversation um, presenting to an audience at a business school where I said I was studying the relationship between slavery and capitalism. And they were like, oh, are you saying something good about slavery? And I was like, no, no, I'm saying something critical about capitalism. But it was like the idea had never even occurred to them to think about uh, those two things in conversation. But on the other hand, when does just what we might call innocent surprise turn into denial? There's a fabulous essay by a British scholar named Bill Cook called The Denial of Slavery and Management Studies. And he basically says, I didn't even have to go to the archives if I just read a number of books about the history of American slavery, it's abundantly clear that planters were management innovators. And the fact that that's been left out of our histories of business practices, um, you know, it was so easy to find this information that it's not just about surprise, it's about denying the existence because it's just so much easier to write a you know, a management history that's all about railroads than it is to reckon, really reckon with one that involves slavery. You know, we have dozens and dozens of historians that have explored this era, right? Like, this is not a, like, when I say this era, I mean, just, we have plenty of folks who have written about slavery. And I'm curious as to why do you think you are able to identify, like, the business and, like, organizational culture and elements within the history itself? That's a great question because a lot of the records I use, I'm not the first person who's looked at them, but very few business historians have looked at the records of slavery. There's the assumption that these records are not going to yield interesting stories or people just, you know, they go to look at textile mills, but it never occurs to them to look at the plantations that are growing the cotton for those textile mills to look at. So while lots of people had looked at these records, Almost nobody who was interested in business history had looked at records of slavery. And I also was, I you know, worked as a management consultant for a few years. So I think that when I picked up the records, I was kind of looking at them through the eyes of a business person and seeing the ways that planters were using data to extract wealth from people in a kind of unique way. I'm probably the only person who accidentally wrote a, you know, a book about slavery. Um, I came into this planning to write a book about data and scale. I was interested in what happens when businesses get big and they start to see their workers more as entries in a spreadsheet than as individuals. And I started that where I thought the story would be, which was in textile mills and iron forges. And then someone handed me a copy of a plantation account book from the same time, same time period. And it was just as sophisticated and in some ways more sophisticated than the stuff I'd been looking at where I thought the story must have been starting. So speaking to that, right, like we didn't really get into your background. We talked a little bit about where you came from academically, but you were a consultant. Yeah, I spent th three years right out of college as the uh, uh, ma business analyst at McKinsey and Company. So I was like the person in the conference room running the spreadsheet and doing doing the numbers. And that was the kind of 
lens I brought to these record books. When I saw planters collecting huge amounts of data on saved people, I was imagining what they were trying to get out of that data. Because nobody collects data just for fun. People collect data because they think they're going to be able to put it to use. And in planters' case, it's because they think they're going to get people to do more work and they're going to be able to make more money. And so like I brought that lens to a totally different setting. What's what's curious also though is because I you know I did of course we at Living Corporate we tried to do a little bit of research on the folks we bring on the pocket and I uh, you know I looked up I didn't see you marching with Black Lives Matter or you know talking with DeRay McKesson or um, you know sitting down or doing any type of like grassroots movement and yet here you are like you said you've written a whole book about <laughs> about slavery I'm curious as to about I'm curious as to what at what point. Or did you ever have a conscious like decision like, wow, wait a second, I've come on to something pretty profound here. What propelled you to push forward and like engage this uncomfortable subject? Because like the reality is, and we talked about at the top of the at the top of the interview, right? Like a lot of white folks don't aren't comfortable talking about slavery or 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 constantly are seeking to uh, moralize it or dismiss it or d- diminish the the immorality of it. And but but you didn't do that, right? Like you, and I'm not trying to like give you a whole bunch of cookies here. I'm just saying like you, you still, you wrote the book, right? Like in you, in fairly, fairly critically. And so I'm curious as to at any point in time, like, did you feel discomfort in like in the, in the subject matter you were engaging? Um, what did that so look the, like? You know, I, first of all, I, it's been a learning process and I'm still learning. I feel like slavery keeps unfolding itself to me as even bigger and worse than I had previously understood. So it's like, I feel like I've learned something in the last 10 years and I learned something before then. So, but I would also say that even when I was a consultant, I was sometimes disturbed by the idea that I, this 22 year old with a spreadsheet was gonna have an impact on the lives of a worker or a customer who I knew nothing about I didn't really even understand their business. I mean, I understood some fundamental things that let me make good recommendations for making more money, but were those recommendations in line with, you know, having say good jobs or a good product? And there's just real limitations on what you can learn when you're the person sitting in front of a spreadsheet. And so I felt like there was a kind of danger there. And that was something that I started to see in the plantation records. I would also say when I was in graduate school during Black Lives Matter, I, I suppose I don't I don't know if I'm becoming radicalized because I actually don't think this is a radical move at all. Right. I think it's just about like recognizing what the history is. And I keep learning. I'm still so, I'm sometimes comfortable talking about race and sometimes I'm a typical uncomfortable white lady. Um, <laughs> but but I would you know, it's been a learning process. I'm also, you know, the book is about rich white people, um, in a way. Yeah, and it's true. about the harm that they're doing. And I think we like need to disentangle that harm. And you can see the enslaved people through the book, but not as well as you can see there, the planters. Well, it, you know, it, it's, it's interesting um, when you talk about, when you talk about like not wanting to, like, you know, having various levels of comfort with race. I think the, it's just interesting to me because when I think about this work and I think about like, you talk about like you're not being, you, know, you feel like you're being radicalized, but not really, cause it's not really radical. The, real, the reality is like so much of this history is not told, right? Like you've, you've come up, you've written a book, a factual book about how, about management philosophies and management practices within uh, chattel slavery. And it's, it's groundbreaking because we have yet to, as a country, really reckon and have an honest objective conversation about race like we've had these books like there's there's conversations of course and they're coming more to the forefront over the past decade or so right and i and i and i get that like we're not on a path it's not a straight path things kind of are um uh they're cyclical in, in certain ways but my point is like i do think there is a certain level of radical of radical thought that has to happen to just be not anti-black right like it's pretty common like to just dismiss experiences to downplay history to ignore history um i'm curious about like do you feel it do you believe that your your whiteness has afforded you any opportunity to be heard as you talk about these things um do you feel as if and i recognize you're also at the same time a woman like how do you feel as if your your own identity um has come to to play a role in 
your work being received and heard? Well, I have gotten a lot less of the just nasty racist pushback. I mean, I feel like watching, I mentioned watching Nicole Hannah-Jones. I also have a colleague here at Berkeley, Stephanie Jones Rogers, who's written a fabulous book on white women in the South and their investment in slavery. And she's gotten both lots of great attention because the book's awesome, but also she's gotten all kinds of nasty pushback. And I feel like I've dodged a lot of that. Um, and the only explanation that I can give for that is that kind of I'm a, a white person delivering a message in a way that people are slightly more comfortable with. And it has to be about race because talking about how slavery um, kind of was a, was a management advantage for planters, as you say, is in a way a radical idea. Um, so, so let's, let's do this. You know, in, in, in previous interviews, um, you talk about innovations, um, that have come from this era, um, from, and from chattel slavery. Can we, can we talk about, can you name like three big points of innovation that you believe, um, or that rather that history shows originated or that we can trace back to this era? So this is a typical historian thing to do where I'm, I'll be a little dodgy on if they're, they actually originate here, but fair, I will <laughs> three, three areas where I think planters and slaveholders were in a sense at the cutting edge for their time period. Okay. Um, so the first um, is the development of and use of standardized forms for long distance reporting. So if you look at massive plant plantations in the Caribbean and some in the American South, but especially in the Caribbean, because these are the big businesses of the, 18th and 19th century, and they might have had thousands of enslaved people working on them. They're often run by absentee planters who've left the plantation and returned to England. And they develop standardized uh, reporting forms that are kind of fill in the blanks forms where they can keep track of labor, keep track of their costs, uh, and therefore manage the plantation from a distance. Um, so they're, they're developing information systems at a high level that mm. you don't see in other areas. And I think that that makes it easier for them to uh, manage uh, slavery, which, you know, abolition is on the rise, but from a distance, you don't have to confront some of the worst aspects of plantation slavery. You can just pay attention to your profits and the allocation of labor. So that's the first one is standardized forms. The second one is the development and the use of depreciation. Uh, business historians talk about depreciation and cost accounting as absolutely essential in the um, the development of the railroads and of big factories in the 19th century. What they don't talk about is the fact that uh, plantation owners are de appreciating and depreciating enslaved people. And not only that, but they are writing instructions on how to do that from the late 1840s forward. And it's if you look at accounting textbooks from the 19th century, you don't find accounting textbooks for free labor that are talking about depreciation until, you know, almost the end of the 19th century, like the 1880s, 1890s, and even then they're scarce. And you can find planters giving advice in the 1840s. So almost a half a century earlier. And then the third one, which I think is the most important really, I guess I've buried the lead, is productivity analysis. A lot of cotton planters kept track of how much labor every enslaved person did every day on the plantation. In particular, they tracked how much cotton each person picked and they traced it day to day um, uh, and compared it over time and compared it between people and they used and set incentives and also punishment um, uh, and violence to create w reasons to accelerate people's pace of labor. Can so we talk about the incentives? So uh, uh, plant, so I, when I say incentives, I mean, I guess, carrot and stick. Um, in some cases, there are small payments tied to people picking over the total amount that they are expected to pick in a day. Um, so they could, they would get paid for picking more. Planters sometimes even run contests where they get people to pick as fast as they can and they make payments to the people who pick the most. But of course, these things are dangerous for enslaved people because they reveal to planters how much cotton they can pick. So they often have their targets increased after they receive these these payments. Um, hmm. On the other side is when you, if you don't pick cotton well, you might get whipped. And there are several slave narratives that talk about this, not just as the general threat of violence, but they talk about people being whipped uh, one lash for each pound that they fall short of 
you know, their, their picking total. So it's almost like they're being incentivized to pick each additional pound of cotton. Now that system, we don't have evidence of how widespread it was, but at least a number of slave narratives recount that one, one lash per pound incentive. So when we talk about these plantations, I'm thinking about the reality of scale. Right. In my mind, there's just no way a handful of white folks could directly oversee all of those slaves. So in any of your research, did you come across like delegation strategies employed by plantation owners? So scale is a huge problem for planters, but it's also one of their huge advantages. I mean, they're the biggest um, kind of big agriculture of the time and that is a way for them to make more money. And they have basically two options when they're trying to manage scale. Um, One option is delegation of labor. And for example, on West Indian plantations, this was like an immense hierarchy. You had white bookkeepers managing black drivers who are managing um, uh, field hands. And then you have also head coopers, head sawyers, skilled laborers managing entire teams of workers under them. But even more important than that, I think, was the kind of role of enslaved watchmen. So planters would require enslaved people to keep surveillance over different parts of the plantation. And often they would use elderly enslaved people, people who didn't have a lot of power to push back, uh, disabled enslaved people. Um, and these people were intended to make reports based on the plant, on what's happening on the plantation back to the overseer so that they can be aware of any kind of possible um, resistance or um, mm-hmm. rebellion. Um, and I have like, a, for example, I have a plantation in Jamaica, it was about 450 people and they employ 20 of those 450 people as watchmen on the plantation. Wow. So they have not only enslaved managers um, who are often doing very skilled work, um, but they also have watchmen who are kind of presenting, providing another layer of information. Now, of course, that is also really dangerous for planters because this labor is not freely given. Um, and so the surveillance, you know, they're trying to create systems with multiple layers of surveillance to create safety, but it's also watchmen and other people like them are potentially in a position to push back and to help each other um, and to prevent the planter from having that much power. So that's the first strategy for dealing with scale is surveillance and delegating labor of surveillance. Uh, the other uh, strategy that planters use is, is really about data. Um, I mentioned that they keep track of how much cotton every enslaved person picks every single day. Right. And we have slave narratives where they talk about weighing the cotton three times a day. So an enslaved person is out picking in the field and they come in and they have the cotton weighed and they have it written down on a, on a slate. And then that happens again and again. And then all that data is totaled up and entered into a book. And that uh, means that the, the data can substitute for someone watching the labor all the time. And planters are able to kind of push up the pace of labor um, using data on picking rather than using kind of immediate surveillance. I, I just, I find that incredible um, that, because uh, I, I didn't, I was unaware, I was unaware of the the idea that the the planters or the, the, the plantation owners, that they would, um, they would employ the weaker slaves um, to be the overseers and again and you know and, I, and we don't you know this is a podcast we don't have like a like a visual but so you're saying that the, the overseers would be managing the managers so there were there were like people who were skilled laborers and, and and even those skilled laborers had an overseer so basically you have two sets of managers and this very i'm talking about one particular plantation i have in sure, mind but, sure but they have um they would have a head driver or an overseer. And that person would usually be like able-bodied. They wouldn't be a, you know, a 22 year old who's incredibly fast and, and strong. Okay. And someone who's, you know, maybe in their forties and is like a seasoned expert worker and also not the weakest. But then they also had, in addition to say the people who are in this managerial position, they have enslaved watchmen. And enslaved watchmen are really in a, tend to be not able-bodied um, or el- they tend to be elderly. And they're assigned to different places on the plantation to keep watch and to make reports. So in a way, they are creating two layers of surveillance. One that's about managing productivity, 
and that's going to be an able-bodied person usually but then they also are you know they have all they have elderly and uh, they have a whole community of people and they're figuring out how to make use of people who can no longer do physical labor um, to provide this kind of information labor wow um you, you know let, let's talk a little bit you we let's talk a little bit more about the makeup of, of plantations and admittedly in real time while you're talking about um while you're talking about um the like folks being disabled like i'm i'm now realizing also that there there was a disabled population of individuals on these plantations i just again just part of my able-bodied privilege i don't think about that i don't think about the fact that there are uh uh differently able people in these spaces as well um and let's continue to talk about that right like you have children you have teens you have adults you have older adults um you have a various uh able-bodied and disabled people you have members of the african diaspora uh, that comes with different languages and cultures you have white men you have white women you have biracial men and women um, due to the raping of black women and you even have uh, varied levels of authority, like we just talked about, across the plantation and skill um, from those in the field, um, in various parts of the field or parts of the land, uh, to those um, closer to the house or inside of the house. Um, we have these conversations today about diversity and inclusion, right? And diversity being, uh, um, uh, well, what's, the, what's the cute phrase people say? Diversity is going to the party inclusion is being invited to dance or something like that so you so you you really do have you have a, a wide array of generational racial gender uh, able-bodied um, disabled uh, representation and then from an inclusion perspective you have people who are at various levels of authority um, and engagement with the business of the plantation but what you don't have um, is is equity right like is that fair? Do you think is that a fair characterization to say that these these spaces were they had a wide array of people doing a wide array of things, but they just weren't being treated equally? I think that that's a insightful way to put it. Um, you have so you can if you look at this through the lens of a planter's account book. Planters literally took inventory of enslaved people. They wrote down everybody's name and their age and their occupation, and they put a number value on the person. And you see that they are valuing and have in their workplace, you know, the whole spectrum of a, of a community in a way that we rarely do today. But then, what are they doing with that? They're not valuing everyone of that community equally. They're valuing them radically differently, and they're figuring out ways to exploit who they can in different ways to make profits. Um, so you have them valuing a small child, increasing their value year after year after year. Um, you have them depreciating an elderly person, and then eventually, that you know someone becomes worth to the planter less than zero, and they have to continue feeding and housing that person, but they don't have to continue caring for them or treating them with any kind of equity or respect. Um, you know, it's interesting. Like I've, I'm certain I'm working on a new project right now about. Uh, a 20th century project about the history of HR yeah. and one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is the kind of quote unquote business case for diversity um, yeah. <laughs> and people are like you know we all got to get diverse because it makes us more profitable and I feel like um, well there's two issues with that number one is like is that really our bottom line with diversity is profit and you know like are we going to not say that we have like concerns about bigger things like justice. Right. <laughs> the first thing is like, that's the number one. But then, then there's also like this really, like what if we think about the plantation as part of the business case for diversity? Um, planters mm. are figuring out how to manage a diverse population to make a whole pile of money out of it. Um, you mentioned that there are people from different uh, African, of different African descents. Um, planters in Jamaica sometimes would have a diverse population of people from different places. Um, because they're able to play people off against each other or to exploit the fact that not everybody speaks the same language and therefore they can't kind of work together against the planter as effectively. So there, these people are in a way making a business case for diversity. It's just a really dark business place, case for diversity. Wow. Um, so, and I think we can't assume that the business debate case for diversity is going to be a good one. So I, like I, I'm in one way, I kind of, 
am inspired by people who are seeking to like figure out how diverse play workplaces can make us more efficient. But I also worry so much about making a kind of financial bottom line, the goal of diversity. Well, I think, and I think to your point, like we, America historically has always seen a business case for diversity. Like you said, it's just been a darker one than we maybe were comfortable in, not maybe that we're comfortable in discussing, but you know, with, without the various types of folks um, that were enslaved and uh, worked and abused, uh, we wouldn't have had the production and the labor that we had that was then able to um, drive and create this country, right? So I, I, I think I, I think you're right. I, you know, it really leads me to, to my next question, because when I look and I think about, um, I think about reading your book, we talked, we talked a little bit about how connected this enterprise was for multiple generations of Americans, right? Like, so this was, you know, it, it's not, it, there's others, you know, when you think about the 1619 project and other points of research that, that for even those who didn't own slaves, Slavery was seen as a, a, mar a social status, right? Like having, having, owning a slave, owning someone was seen as similar to how we would view owning a house, right? It was something that you would, you aspired, you you would aspire to have. Um, and for those who were too poor to outright own slaves, um, there were folks who rented slaves for social events or different occasions or a weekend or, or something like that. Um, this was not like this insular thing just for planters. Um, it it was connected to a larger economy. Um, by which the the nation at the time was sustained. Um, and it would seem like for something like this to persist for over 200 years, folks would have to believe um, these bodies were less than human by varying degrees. You've used the term reckon. I mean, that stuck out to me, Dr. Rosenthal, reckon. Um, when it comes to grappling with this history, what does reckoning mean to you? I like the word reckon because it has a narrow math meaning that means, you know, to historically reckoning was calculating, um, but it also has come to mean to grapple with um, historically. And a big lesson of these records for me is how easy, so there's like two, two parts of the record. Like you look at this inventory of people and it's totally horrifying, but as I'm flipping through the, you know, the pages, I can also just start reckoning and start calculating and I can overlook what the record is about. I can just deal with the data and mm -hmm. data can make it really easy to forget what's actually going on there. So it, I think the data has, and the kind of these records have the potential to make things about our history visible to us, but they also have the potential to help us to overlook other kinds of things. So when I talk about reckoning, I, I'm thinking about kind of using this historical data for new purposes, like kind of turning it around so that instead of erasing people, it can help to make people visible um, and to make the history more visible than it had been before. And in particular, to make it visible for a group of Americans who I think don't think that what they do has very much at all to do with the history of slavery. You know, people who think about themselves as business innovators, even the ones who are interested in history, read books about good business practices. They read about, you know, the rise of computing and steam engines and railroads mm -hmm. and very rarely read about bad business. So what can we learn if we really pay more attention to these and to the people who are, you know, made visible in these records? Do you think that there are points of connection and things that people can learn and how they change their business practices today by studying the business practices of this era. So I think there's a really powerful cautionary tale about how easy it is um, to treat people as less than human um, when you have your eye on the bottom line and you're only dealing with a narrow set of data. Now the solution to that isn't to like kick data and business and profit out the window. Right. But it is to be aware on a much deeper level of what the data is not showing us and the limitations of what you're going to see through that process. I also think there's a, I mean, so that's like a, the generic lesson, but there's also like, here we are sitting in America, a country built in part on slavery. Like, what do we need to specifically do? Um, mm. and, you know, I'm really, for example, historians of the Holocaust 
I have done amazing work, amazing business histories of companies that profited from the Holocaust and have really dug deep into that history to, to encounter more closely. And I feel like American business could do the same with the history of slavery. Um, it's not that long ago and lots of American businesses, you know, uh, like for example, there's been recent work on the life and on life insurance, New York life, I think, um, several other really big modern companies issued slave policies. Um, so what do we, you know, how can modern companies kind of literally go back and find out about the specific history? Because the specific history is just as important as this kind of general, well, be careful with your data. No, well, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we can talk, I mean, you can just Google it too, to your point, like you know, Rothschild Sons and Bank in London, Norfolk Southern, Aetna Insurance, New York Life, JP Morgan Chase, um, you know, plenty of organizations, um, Johnson & Johnson, Barclays, Brooks, Brooks Brothers. Yeah, it's, it's a long list. It's a long list. And I think, and I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, I think, I think my, I think my challenge when it comes to when we talk about conversations like this on Living Corporate and broad, more broadly, just with diversity, equity, and inclusion, when it comes to, I think the push for us to like center and amplify black and brown marginalized experiences, um, there's also an unspoken understanding that should there should there should be some equity and just there's equity and justice that comes with that, because if you can take a step away from and not and not not dismissing it but looking at the people behind the data, right? And like actually trying to, and actually examining their experience um, and the the pain that was wrought from some of these practices. The next point of that conversation is, okay, well, so now what does accountability look like for, uh, for the pain and the loss? Um, even if we're just speaking from like a business perspective, right? Like there were, there are, there are, there are records um, and there, there are, <laughs> there are things that are owed, um, and there is a lack of some like there are parties that need to be made whole here based on um, these practices. But anyway, Dr. Rosenthal, this has been a super dope conversation. I'm really excited. Like, y'all, when I, when Dr. Rosenthal hit me back and said she was going to she was down to be on the podcast, I was like, oh, I hit up a lot of people and told them about this episode. So I'm really excited for folks to hear this one um, before we let you go. Any parting words or shout outs? You know, in kind of ending with the conversation you were ending with, I feel like we're going to be waiting a long time for a national reparations, but there's so many opportunities, you know, universities are really doing it um, uh, and hopefully more businesses are going to start to do with it to kind of investigate and take some kind of reparative action for not just the history of slavery, but the history of slavery as it's descended to us today through Jim Crow, through segregation, etc. So, I mean, I feel like we're going to be waiting on reparations hope but there's just so many possibilities for where we can make small differences that are really big differences i 100 percent agree with you um y'all this has been uh another episode of living corporate make sure you check us out on twitter at living corporate underscore pod on instagram at living corporate uh you make sure you check us out on uh, all the googles all the al gore internets okay you type in living corporate we're gonna pop up but it's living corporate.com.us.co.tv.org um not living corporate.com australia has living corporate.com what's up australia we're gonna get that domain from y'all uh but also you can type in living dash corporate.com please hit the dash and we'll pop up um yeah look until next time oh hold on make sure y'all y'all check out the show notes right we're gonna have uh we're gonna have all the information about dr rosenthal some a little bit more supplementary information about uh the history of slavery i definitely gonna put the 1619 project but of course we're gonna put accounting for slavery masters in management um in the show notes make sure y'all click that get the copy of the book it's phenomenal uh, until next time, y'all, peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.